If you would please open your Bibles or scroll to your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 16. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. As you're getting there, let me just say I have the opportunity to preach at a number of churches, but there's no place like home. It is good to be here at Redeemer Church. We have been blessed, Janae, Jack, and I, by the many relationships and the wonderful people here. So thank you very much. It's a privilege to open God's Word with you today. Before I go any further, let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Our Father God, sanctify us in the truth. Your Word is truth. Lord, we come to you this morning dirty, filthy, unclean, stained by our own sins and the sins of the world. And we ask God that you would clean us up, wash us with your word of truth, sanctify us, help us to be more like Jesus. I ask, Lord, that you would use me, a humble servant, not worthy of this great responsibility to proclaim your word. But may your word go forth and not come back void. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read the word of the Lord from Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. And one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It's the word of the Lord. If you would indulge me and allow me to read to you once more, I want to read to you a brief passage from the beginning of a book, and I will explain more about that in one second. I knew the patient before she died. It was 10 years ago. She was very sick at the time, but she didn't want to admit it. There was only a glimmer of hope at best, but that hope could become a reality only with radical change. She wasn't nearly ready for that change. Indeed, she was highly resistant to any change, even though she was very sick, even though she was dying. I told her the bad news bluntly, you are dying. I hope I said those words with some compassion. I did feel badly sharing the news, but it was the only way I could see to get her attention. I even told her that, at best, she had five years to live. At the time I said those words, I don't think I really was that optimistic. I would not have been surprised if she died within a year. But she was not only in denial, she was in angry denial. I'll show you, she said. I'll prove you're wrong. I'm not dying. Her words were fierce, defiant, angry. It was time for me to leave. I had done all I could. I left. I was not angry. I was sad, very sad. 
Now, to her credit, she was right up to a point. She did not die in five years. She proved resilient. She survived another 10 years, but her last decade, though she was technically alive, was filled with pain, sickness, and despair. I'm not so sure her longer-term survival was a good thing. She never got better. She slowly and painfully deteriorated, and then she died. She, of course, is a church. That's the introduction to a book called Autopsy of a Deceased Church, 12 Ways to Keep Yours Alive by a man named Tom Rayner. And I think from listening to that, you'll agree that a dying church is a depressing sight. Now, the Universal Church, capital C, she'll never die, right? The Lord is building her and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. But individual churches, local congregations, they can and do die. Sometimes we have no explanation. Well-meaning, very faithful people are in these churches, and sometimes it happens. Sometimes it happens suddenly, like through a church split or some scandal in the leadership, or sometimes it happens gradually. They just wither away right before your eyes. Thankfully, though, this doesn't describe our congregation. I've been a Christian almost 20 years, and I've been a member of many different churches, and this is by far the healthiest congregation I've ever been a part of, and we thank God for that. At the same time, we're between senior ministers, and we're looking, and so maybe we're wondering if the blessings we've received up till now, will they continue? The church we know today, will it be the church that is healthy and vibrant and alive tomorrow? Well, I think we have good reason to be optimistic, uh, for one, the Lord. For two, we have faithful servants here. But we should never get complacent. And I think any church, no matter where you are in terms of a senior minister or the life of the church, we all need to be thinking about the life and health of the church. As a matter of fact, that's probably a better way to think about it. Instead of how do we not die, how do we live? How do we keep fit and, and healthy and growing as the body of Christ. And that's the burden of this passage today. The question this passage answers is, how does the body grow? And it tells us at least three ways the body grows. The body grows through unity. The body grows through diversity. And the body grows through ministry. The body grows through unity, diversity, and ministry. So as we go to this first point about unity, let's keep in mind, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's writing to believers. In the first verse of chapter 4, he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. In other words, he's talking to the called out ones, the ecclesia, the believers, the people of God. And furthermore, he uses this metaphor of a body he calls the body of Christ. He's comparing it to a living physical body which has members, and that's important for us to understand as we go throughout the rest of these verses to see how he's comparing these. And the message in these first six verses is simple. It's unity. Paul uses the word one seven times in just the span of three verses, starting at chapter four, he says this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Unity. A divided body cannot grow. The church grows through being united. But this isn't, this isn't just any kind of unity. You can be unified for all kinds of reasons. You could be unified in your love for a sports team. You could be unified in your stance on a certain social issue. You could be unified just by geography, living in the same area. That's not the kind of unity that the apostle is talking about here. He's talking about something much deeper, something much stronger. The church has a unity of the Spirit. That's why it says in verse 3 that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the what? The Spirit. 
This is a bond stronger than any other. It's a bond that allows us to stay together no matter how different we are. It is a unity that is a blood-bought bond secured by Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you from experience, this stuff works. The unity of the spirit does keep people together. I have the privilege and the, the opportunity to be the director of the African-American Leadership Initiative at Reformed Theological Seminary. And so we have two main goals with AALI, as we call it. One, we want to recruit more minorities to the seminary, but the second goal is broader. We want to equip students of any race for African-American, multi-ethnic, or urban ministry, cross-cultural ministry. And so in order to do that, we've got to enter into some difficult, sensitive conversations about race and culture and class. We got to talk about all those things they tell you not to talk about in polite company, because that's the only way we'll move forward. And you know how we begin every conversation like that? We sit everyone down, and before we get started talking, we say, listen, this is a family conversation. If you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are, in fact, members of one body. Which means even though we're sinful, even though we're finite human beings and we all have blind spots, we can point out each other's blind spots with grace. We can speak the truth in love, just like this passage says. And it works, and I don't mean that we come out agreeing on every topic or having the same opinion about everything, but we do come out still bonded, still members of one body. That's the kind of unity that causes the body to grow. As a matter of fact, that's the kind of unity that creates and holds together a church like Redeemer. Now, you know, of course, that every church has tension within it because people are different. And even if they're not different racially and ethnically, they're different in all kinds of other ways, experientially, educationally, economically, you name it. But in a church like ours, which is intentionally multi-ethnic, those tensions are heightened because those differences are greater. So how does a church like this stay together? It's not because you want it to. It's not because you tried hard. It's because we're united by the Spirit. That all sounds really good, but there's a couple of things we need to remember. First of all, you can only experience this unity if you've actually put your faith in Christ. So there may be some out there who are listening and this sounds really good. I'd like a community like this. It's yours if you believe. And when you believe, you are grafted into the body. You become a member of Christ's unified body. But I would assume most of us are already believers. So what? Well, here's a second condition. Don't fall into the temptation of reading this passage abstractly. When you read that phrase, one body, don't simply think of the universal church. It is talking about all believers around the world throughout all time are one body. But at the same time, the life of the body can only be lived out in local community. You can't be united to the body theoretically. You have to be united to the body actually, particularly. Really? And that's an argument for church membership. I know it's the beginning of the school year, and so we may have new students coming in, we may have folks starting new jobs, and you're sort of searching around for different churches. I would encourage you to bond yourself to a local congregation as quickly as possible. You'll never find a perfect congregation. Let me just put that out there but you can find a healthy one. And that's what you need to look for. Now, membership has its benefits. Membership means that you are entitled to the care of the congregation, which means when you're going through stuff, you don't have to do it on your own, but there are church members, members of the body there to help you. In addition, it gives you the opportunity, the privilege even, of serving other members when they're in need. It also entitles you to the care of the elders, the leaders of the church who are entrusted with governing the church and church discipline. Why? To help you walk in a manner worthy 
of your calling. If you have believed and you believe in this unity, you can only fully experience it if you are united to a local congregation. This is why we have the Redeemers, the Inquirers class each fall and each spring if you want to learn more about what membership means. But it doesn't have to be here at Redeemer. It's any Bible-believing church, any church that's faithful to the Scriptures. The unity of Christ is only experienced in an actual body. The body grows through unity, but unity doesn't mean uniformity. And that brings us to our second point, that the body grows through diversity. So verses 1 through 6, unity. Now verse 7, let's read it. It says, but stop, don't go any further. That word right there is important because it signals a shift. Verses 1 through 6, Paul is all about unity. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, unified body. Then chapter 7 shifts it. He says, but remember this. Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, in this passage, grace means a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is a supernatural ability given by the Holy Spirit so you can serve the body. A supernatural gift given by the Holy Spirit so that you can serve the body. And furthermore, he says, not only do we have gifts, but grace was given to each one of us individually. How? According to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, you have a gift. It's different from your neighbors and it's in a different amount. You can almost picture Jesus going to each believer and saying, here's your gift. And here's your gift. And here's your gift. Each one special, each one unique, each one perfectly suited for the role he wants you to play in the body. Now, a couple words about spiritual gifts, because this brings up all kinds of stuff for us. Maybe you don't even know what spiritual gifts are. I think the best place in the New Testament to go is 1 Corinthians 12, where it gives us a list of spiritual gifts. Among those gifts are the utterance of wisdom, the utterance of knowledge, faith, healing, working miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, languages, interpretation of languages. And that's not an exhaustive list. Lots of Christians have come up with other categories and other lists. For example, other spiritual gifts might include administration, encouragement, giving, hospitality, leadership, exhortation, and many, many more. Now, there are some differences between the gifts given in biblical times and now, but the point here is not to describe each gift and what it is, but to simply say that we have them and they're different in different amounts. And let's also remember that a spiritual gift is just that. It's a gift, which means you didn't earn it. You didn't ask for it. And God didn't make a mistake. He has given you a spiritual gift according to his goodwill, in the exact measure he wants you to have it. And he didn't mess up. He knows the job that he has for you in the body, and he has perfectly equipped you to carry it out. Now, I am by no stretch of the imagination a hockey fan. Um, I went to one hockey game in my life as a kid. My dad took me to a Blackhawks game, and I fell asleep. Uh, no offense to hockey fans, it's just not my thing. But I do like a movie about hockey, and that movie's called Miracle. Many of you may have seen it. The actor Kurt Russell plays coach Herb Brooks, who coaches the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team. And they pull off a sports miracle. They beat the multiple-time reigning world champion Russians in hockey. Height of the Cold War, East against West. And they beat them, the underdogs beat them and go on to win the gold medal in the U.S. Olympics. But the miracle thing wasn't really just that they beat them. It was how they beat them. You see, Coach Brooks had the opportunity to choose all the best players in the United States. And he could have chosen all of the all-star players. But he did something different. They had a week 
of tryouts. And on the first day, he was done with his roster. He had chosen all his players. And his assistant coach was a little perplexed. He was confused. And his assistant coach is named Craig. And Craig says this. He says to Coach Brooks, you're missing some of the best players. And Coach Brooks says to him, I'm not looking for the best players, Craig. I'm looking for the right ones. You see, the genius of Coach Brooks was not to just get all the best players, lump them together, and let them go. He got just the right players with just the right skills, just the right gifts. And when they put them all together, they were a team. They were a unit. They were a body that was unstoppable. Brothers and sisters, God's not looking for you to be an all-star. He's looking for you to have this one particular gift, this one little piece of the puzzle that when we all come together, fits right in its place and makes the body grow. So at this point, you may be asking yourself a couple questions. One, do I have a spiritual gift? I, pretty, I feel pretty talentless. And number two, if I do have a spiritual gift, what is it? Well, the answer to the first question is easy. Do I have a spiritual gift? Yes, you do have a spiritual gift. One, the Holy Spirit himself is a gift. That's why Peter says in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, certainly, this could refer to individual spiritual gifts like we've been talking about, but at least it refers to the Holy Spirit himself. So I'm telling you, if you have believed in Jesus Christ, then you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you have a gift. Beyond that, though, what is my gift? Some of you know, some of you don't. Some of you are still figuring it out. Well, there's two dimensions. You have to look both inward and outward. So looking inward, sometimes you you've maybe have taken before or at least heard of a, a spiritual inventory. And this is where they ask you all these questions about your interests, likes, dislikes, experiences. And basically, you know, there's different tests, but you may come up with a score and it may rank your spiritual gifts, the top three or the top five. And those are good. Those at least point you in a direction. But that's certainly not all to discovering your spiritual gifts. As a matter of fact, discovering your spiritual gifts is a lot more about trial and error than anything else. You can't discover your gifts simply by sitting in a room and thinking about it. One pastor puts it this way. Very few people have broad enough ministry experience to really know what gifts they have. Until you've done work with the poor or cross-cultural ministry or door-to-door -door evangelism, it's difficult to know whether you have those gifts or not. I've seen people absolutely petrified by visitation evangelism and who agreed to evangelism training only under protest, yet they emerged as a dedicated and obviously gifted evangelist. You have a gift, but the best way to discover that gift is often through experimentation. So let me put it very technically to you. You have to get out there and do stuff. Try it and see. And doing stuff brings us to our third and final point. The body grows through ministry. It grows through unity, grows through diversity of gifts, but it also grows through Ministry, And that's the focus of verses 11 through 16. So after explaining unity of the body, after explaining that we have all kinds of gift, gifts, then Paul goes on to list several gifts in verse 11. He says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Now, we don't have time to go into a thorough description of each of those gifts, but there are certain characteristics that all of those gifts have in common. These you could call the word-based gifts or the proclamation gifts. They all have to do directly with the word of God and explaining it. They're also what you might call some public gifts or upfront gifts. The people who have them tend to be standing up in front of people and explaining God's word. And so these gifts all have those kinds of things in common. But 
because they're public or upfront, that doesn't mean that these people are any more special than anyone else. Again, they're gifts. They didn't ask for them. They didn't earn them. God gave them. And because God gave them, he has a purpose for them. Go on to verse 12. Why do we have these folks? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. For building up the body of Christ. The point of having these gifts is, is, is that they help serve the body. These folks are like the cooks serving up steaming plates of, of gospel goodness that we're just supposed to consume to give us energy to serve the body. That's how it's supposed to work. The goal is to have all members, both the leaders and the led, work together for the good of the whole. That's why in verses 15 and 16 it says, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into every way, into him who is the head, into Christ, from the, whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, that's you, with which it is equipped, when each part, that's you again, is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. As we each use our gifts to minister to the body, the body is nourished and it grows. But it's not that easy. Have you ever heard of the 80-20 rule or the 20-80 rule? I've heard it used in different contexts. But the basic idea is this. In any organization, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Or to flip it over, 80% of the people end up doing just 20% of the work. Now you translate that into church and what happens. What tends to happen is that the paid professional staff the 20% can end up doing the 80% of the work that belongs to the body. And then the rest of us do whatever's left over. So that could be, that could be your, your pastor, that could be the elders, the deacons, the committee heads, the, the, the committee chair people, whoever that is. And you know what that leads to, among other things? It's pastoral burnout. This is a serious issue. There's a New York Times article that says this. The findings have surfaced with ominous regularity over the last few years and with little notice. Members of the clergy now suffer from obesity, hypertension, depression, at rates higher than most Americans. In the last decade, their use of antidepressants has risen while their life expectancy has fallen. Many would change jobs if they could. This whole 80-20 dynamic is literally killing church leaders. But it's not just the members that are imposing that on it. The church leaders can take on too much. But what happens in the 80-20 dynamic is that some people are doing all the work. Some people are exercising their gifts. And then what happens to the rest of us? We sit here and consume and consume and consume all of these services without ever exercising our gifts. And just like the physical body, if you simply consume, you will grow fat, you will grow obese. We can, can, be, we can become spiritually obese if all we do is consume and we never make time to exercise our gifts. Just like the physical body, you have to get up and work to stay fit and healthy and grow. The spiritual body, too, has to work to stay fit and healthy and grow. That takes all of us with our diverse gifts. It's not enough to be united to the local congregation. It's not enough to even have a gift. You have to use it. Now, there are all kinds of opportunities just at our church alone. Listen to some of the opportunities you have. You have men's ministry, women's ministry, children's ministry, always a need for workers and children, youth ministry, nursery, raise, sister cooks, tutoring, the Redeemer School, growth groups, mission to Broadmoor, choir, the kitchen, and so much more. And if you don't find an opportunity that resonates with you, you can probably create one. There's no lack of work to do in the body. And it takes all of us exercising our gifts to make the body grow. Now, I don't know about you, this sounds exhausting. I mean, I just told you, you got to be unified. You got to have a gift and know what it is. And then you got to be constantly working and using and exercising that gift. 
That's exhausting. More than exhausting, it's actually impossible. None of us does this. By tomorrow, we'll forget what we heard. We go about our day-to-day -day lives and work and school and family. And all of this falls away. Why would God do this? Why would he give us such commands if we can't live up to them? Well, all that's true up to a point. God has given us these commands and left on our own to obey them. We couldn't do it. But God, he gave his son, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who offered up his body to death so that this body, the church, could have life. It's Jesus Christ who got cut off from the unity of the body so that we could be united to the body. It's Christ who had all power and all spiritual gifts, who laid his power down and allowed himself to be nailed to a cross so that when he ascended, he could give gifts to us. And it's Christ whose ministry was to live a perfect life, but to die the death of a sinner that we deserved in fulfilling his ministry to the church. He's empowered us to fulfill our ministry. So brothers and sisters, you don't have to feel this weight or this burden to make the church grow. God has already done that work. He's already given us Christ. This reality is ours. We simply have to live into it. We have to embrace it by faith and in dependence on our head, Jesus. There is work to be done, yes, but that work is empowered by Jesus through his Holy Spirit. And so the answer to our initial question, how does the body grow, is really quite simple, isn't it? The body grows through faith in Jesus Christ, the king and the head of the church, his body. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we long to have a healthy church body. We long to be unified even in the midst of our differences. And we desire, Lord, to know what our gifts are and to use them in service to the body. But God, we fully admit our complete and utter dependence on you. We can't do it alone. But we thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus, who has given us all things all things that we need to live a unified life in service to one another. And so, God, we pray that you would press these truths into our hearts. Help us not only to know them, but to do them. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.